A couple of days ago, a content creator on this platform, who also happens to be an emergency physician, asked a question to their large audience of more than half a million people, and I'm paraphrasing, why does it seem as though many African American patients often have people on their phones when they, a doctor, enters the room? Now before I begin, I want to remind you that this platform that I've created has a core purpose of education, and I am not here to demean or embarrass anyone. Uh, I do not believe that that creates a path for understanding and liberation from ignorance. I would also like to say that if you are a person of color, a person who is marginalized, or a person who is othered in any way, shape, or form, and in professional and social environments, you are tasked with the job of educating others about your lived experience. I just want to remind you that that is not your job. You are never required to educate those around you about how systemic structures of hatred affect your life. Education without fair and appropriate compensation is an oppression of your time, and I think everyone should know that. As an example, I have a degree in medicine. I am a board certified emergency medicine physician. I also have a master's in business administration. I've also in my free time built a relatively large social media platform based off of my interests in medicine and diagnosis. And I also happen to be a correspondent on a national televised platform. Can you imagine how frustrating and annoying it might be to walk into a room and for my experience, my training, my talent, my education to be reduced to questions simply asking me about the color of my skin? Which is why my price to answer that question is very high, to accommodate the value of my time. But today's education for you is free. Congratulations. Now, there are many reasons why someone, a patient, might have someone else on the phone with them during a medical encounter. If I notice a pattern like that with my patients, I would ask them. But you should also know that hospitals and emergency rooms specifically can be a dangerous and frightening place for people of color. As an example, there are numerous studies that show black Americans are systematically undertreated for their pain compared to their white counterparts. And unfortunately, that is not required medical education, which is why it is one of my firm beliefs that we continue to have a difficult time within medicine addressing racial bias, addressing acts of medical violence, and also simply repeating history. But thanks to the incredible education and leadership of those working within diversity, equity, and inclusion, more and more people are understanding important historical references, which we must never forget. For example, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments of the 1930s. If you're not aware of this, you should Google it. But you don't even have to look that far back historically to understand references of racial bias within medicine, research, and science. For example, in the early 1990s, 34 young black and Hispanic children were recruited for a study to understand the connection between race and aggression. In this study, these children were given IV medications called pemfluramine, which was later withdrawn from human use due to its deleterious effects on the heart. The point of this study, again, was to study the connection between race and aggression. Only black and Hispanic children were recruited for this study. And just several years ago at the University of Virginia, researchers surveyed 222 white medical students and residents regarding their beliefs about black patients. The results? Nearly 60% of students thought that our skin was thicker, and approximately 12% believed that our nerve endings were less sensitive compared to white patients. And this is only a small percentage of the education needed to fully understand how the mistreatment of marginalized communities has created fertile ground to plant the seeds of mistrust, leading to people pulling out their phones to have someone else in the room during a medical encounter. But what's also important is that when someone asks me a question revolving around race, I am listening very closely to how that question is asked, and I am thinking very critically about why that question was asked, and I'm also categorizing that person on where they fall on the stages of learning racism. Years ago, I published an article titled The Four Stages of Learning About Racism, an adapted version of the stages of competence, because I find it to be very useful, and I think that many of us fall on these four stages. Stage one, the unconscious incompetent person. This person person is unconscious to racism, meaning they are not aware that it exists, and they are incompetent to practicing anti-racism, meaning that they cannot do it. Now this person will likely need a lot of time understanding the history of racism, its existence, whom it affects, and why it's important. Now many would say, stop here, don't go on with the stage one learner, it's too much work. But personally, I believe that there are many people that possess tremendous amounts of empathy, education, awareness, and ability to quickly adapt. So there are many times when an interaction with the stage one learner can be a pleasant one. Stage two, conscious incompetence. This person is conscious, aware of racism, but incompetent 
to practicing anti-racism. This is the person that might say, sure, I'm aware that racism exists, but there's nothing I can do about it. Now, a stage two learner can be a tricky experience and sometimes a waste of my time. I'll use examples, for example, the civil rights movement, and I'll ask what they believe of those who did not actively participate in the civil rights movement to assess if they believe that complacency is a problem. And from there, it can go uphill or it can go straight downhill. And you just simply realize that that person is just deliberately ignorant and in fact, a racist themselves. Stage three is conscious competence. This person is aware that racism exists and actively working to fight against it. Now, this can be an incredibly pleasant experience, but there are times, however, where that person would task those around them, specifically people of color, with continuing their education. And unfortunately, that can be a waste of our time. Stage four, unconscious competence. This person acts without thinking about it. Their skills of anti-racism are built into their everyday actions. They use their privilege to ask the uncomfortable, annoying questions. For example, why is this office so white? But many believe that this stage doesn't truly exist simply because of the structural effects of systemic racism that exists around us and informs our decisions. Now that I've taken you through my mini assessment on interpersonal education on the value of my life, I'd like you to understand something very important. Could you imagine what I could do with my time if I didn't have to do this on a daily basis? If you're truly looking to understand racism, whom it affects, and why it's important, now is the time to move beyond simple postures on social media. If you really want your questions answered, you need to buy a book, you need to look it up, use that information to call out your racist family members, call out your racist co-workers, educate your children. It's time for you to do the work. Okay, let's talk soon.